Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One more time. Good afternoon. Great. Shall we rewind to Monday morning and start again? Excellent. So, welcome to the last session of OWP. I promised on Monday morning during the opening that I will share with you the findings from what the tech exercise. So we have the slides here about what are the business use cases out of transformative digital technologies that you think will impact your business or your industry within the coming three years. So we are happy that 85 participants took an active role, did go through the 42 use cases made available to you, and these are the top five use applications of these technologies. Number one, in intelligent robotics, a human-robot collaboration in the factory of the future. Number two, in AI data analytics, how these technologies can disrupt and transform the investment industry. Number three, smart cities are getting smarter every day. Number four, how AI can boost the recruitment process, can come up by itself by a matchmaking between a CV, key competencies, and an employer requirement, suggesting a short list, and even doing the first round of interview through AI-based AI chatbot. And finally, the brains behind millions of devices, the connected home, the connected devices, how the product becomes a service provider. So clearly you see here AI and data analytics are leading the way with IoT and intelligent robotics next. This is what came up from the 85 participants of OWP this week. I thought sharing with you what other IMD participants in a recent program we launched called Transform Tech what was for them the top five use cases of these digital technologies? And there are only two use cases that overlap between your group and this group. And that is the connected devices. And number two, the human robot collaboration in the factory of the future. The next three use cases were thought important by other participants of IMD, but were not among the top five of your selection, starting with IoT in the industrial sphere. I'll say a few words about it in a minute. The smart factory logistics and how data analytics transform regulatory compliance. So, and you see here the percentage. So again, here we have different technologies selected, but in this case, equal data analytics and IoT. In your selection, it was mainly AI and data analytics. So let me now choose the third and the fifth use cases and tell you a little bit more about each one of them. So here IoT in the industrial sphere, the use case that we featured was about General Electric that has been active in this space for about eight, nine years now, coming up with their industrial internet initiative and the Predix open digital platform that they set up with their customers and partners. So the question is not only we now have a platform-based strategy, it's much more than that in terms of company benefits and consumer benefits as well. So we see here for the, from the company point of view, how to reduce downtime, how to avoid no unplanned breakdowns, which means better productivity, better revenues, ultimately better profit for the company. So how they do that? Big data, analytics, predictive algorithms, and obviously moving from a customer service agreement to outcome-based business model. We share the risk, we share the profit. That is the outcome-based solution. We agree on the KPIs, and we are your business partner to help you achieve them. So this is, and there are case studies written, we have written case studies most recently 
on GE predictive capability and its move to the industrial internet. So this is one use case I wanted to feature. The other one is from Switzerland, how Credit Suisse has been moving from reactive to preemptive or preventive compliance, very much helping in advance look at some data, analyze, obtain a whole view of the customer relationship and ultimately increase accuracy, lower the cost for monitoring and detection, especially of uh, money laundering or similar cases, and obviously doing this in much less time than having investigation officers doing these files of customers. At the end of the day, you also reduce the time for this type of transactions. So again, I just wanted to feature two of the use cases that were not selected by yourselves, but were among the top five selection of other IMD program participants. Again, I remind you that you still have free full access to the 42 use cases. So those who did not have the time, those who really wanted to go through them, but couldn't find the time this week because of a very rich program, you can still connect, you can browse, you can learn, and we'll keep you on our mailing list to share with you in the future some findings from hundreds of participants in IMD programs. I turn the floor to Jean-Francois to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon. Okay, thank you, Tofik. <laughs> so we have had five keynote speakers so far. We started with a discussion of what is, what is a good life and, and what are some of the tools and techniques and approaches that can help us to move toward a good life. Then we had a keynote speaker focusing on digital transformation. Uh, and I guess this was very much coming from the corporate world. Also on Wednesday, we had Peter Voser also coming very much from a corporate world. In between, we had Sibongile Manganirat presenting her own uh, story and her own evolution uh, from uh, Soweto to creating a business that has grown and that is now doing a lot of good for society and also, by the way, being quite successful. Yesterday, of course, we had Arturo uh, sharing some of the research that he and his center are conducting on the world economy and on competitiveness. And now we're about to conclude with Abdel Aziz. Uh, how did I hear about him? I heard about him at the St. Gallen Symposium when I met his co-author on a book uh, that I had a provocative title, um, Good is the New Cool, Market Like You Give a Damn. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And that was indeed a, a book looking at the connection between purpose uh, and success in companies. Then I looked him up and, and I found his two fundamental questions to be quite provocative and I think useful and meaningful for all of us. Uh, Abdel is on a mission to solve two of the biggest problems facing individuals and companies in the 21st century. One, how to find and create purpose and meaning in the work that we do. And two, unlocking the power of business to do good in the world. Now, to help organizations to do better while also doing uh, well financially. He's created a brand purpose consultancy with a provocative name, The Conspiracy of Love. Um, I had the privilege of having lunch uh, with you, Avdel, before, before this talk. This is going to be an interesting, provocative, and, and stimulating final uh, set of ideas before you go back and re-enter reality uh, both on the personal front and on the professional front. But I think this is thinking about what is our purpose and how can we do well by doing good, I think are two wonderful questions to end OWP on. Please give him a warm hand of applause. Hello. Merci, Jean-François. Jean-François took me to get the free ice creams before this talk, which was a bad mistake. 
I, this is one of the greatest perks you guys have, the free ice creams, but not good if you're a speaker. Um, hello, everybody. How you doing? Have you had a good week? Yeah. Yes. I'm all that standing between you and drinks in the sunshine, so I promise I'm going to make this really good. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Jean-Francois and the team here. Um, it's been such a pleasure getting to know this organization and hearing a little bit about what you guys are up to. As Jean-Francois mentioned, we're going to spend the next 45, 50 minutes talking about some of the fundamental questions which some of you in the room may be grappling with. Why am I here? Why am I here on this planet? And what am I going to do with the time that I have left? And how can I potentially leave this world in slightly better shape than we found it? And number two, how can my organization grow and thrive? How do people inside those organizations find meaning and purpose in ways that generate brand love, generate revenue, generate profitability? This is what I spend all of my time thinking about. Um, I'm, I do that via writing for Forbes. I write a column called The Power of Purpose. Uh, I do this via books, so good is a new cool. Currently sold out, by the way, but you can still buy the ebook just in case anyone's wondering. And I do this through Conspiracy of Love, the slightly strange titled uh, consultancy, which I'll reveal the meaning of uh, in a bit. But I want to start by telling you a story that goes back in time as to how I found my own personal purpose as well. And it starts in Sri Lanka, which is uh, the country that I was born in. Hands up anyone who's been to Sri Lanka. All right, that's what I love. People in Europe, you've actually been places. Um, and hands up everybody who knows where Sri Lanka is, theoretically. I'm going to do a test later, guys, because I'm sure some of you don't. It's a little tiny island off the south coast of Sri Lanka. It's a beautiful tropical island, as you can see by this, this picture here. I was born there. I grew up there. I left when I was 19, and I go back there every year. My family lives there. And I was back there for my brother's wedding, um, which is a happy, joyous occasion, right? Your little brother getting married. Unfortunately, I happened to be there on December 26, 2004. That date may ring a bell to some of you. It's the date that the Asian tsunami hit that country. Um, I woke up safe and unharmed on the other side of the island to where the wave hit. I was in Colombo, the capital city. Um, so I was safe. But I woke up in a country where 30,000 of my fellow countrymen had died in one day. Like many of my friends, I got involved in the relief operations in the days and weeks that followed. We did what we could to generate funds for refugees and set up uh, materials for camps. Um, I went back to London, where I lived at the time. I was very happily working in marketing there. But something inside of me had changed. Um, I kept walking down the street and spontaneously bursting into tears. And I didn't know what was going on until I went and saw a therapist. And they said, well, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder. And you've got a very particular type of it, which is called survivor guilt. Why had I survived? And all those other people hadn't. That was really the start of something that changed inside of me as I started to figure out how, whether I could use these skills I had in business and marketing to help other people as well. That was really the point I started to find a, a, a way to merge these things, this desire to help people with what I love doing, working in business and marketing as well. Uh, and that was the beginning of the journey that brought me here to you today. Today we're living in a world which seems more divided than ever before. It's hard sometimes, right, to just not feel like everything is just going to hell in a handbasket. The world feels toxic. And this is not just in the United States where I live. This is around the world. Whether you think about people protesting income inequality in France, the rise of neo-Nazis globally uh, in, in places which hasn't seen it for decades, terrible events like the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand, beautiful, peaceful New Zealand of all, of all places, or the millions of kids who are protesting climate change around the world. Sometimes it feels like this world is on fire. Sometimes it feels like this world is in such a bad place that it's easy to just want to crawl up into like a fetal position and not come out. But I'm here to tell you that there's something that gives me hope. And the thing that gives me hope is this idea. I believe that corporations alongside government can be the greatest force for good this planet has ever seen. I believe that corporations have the scale and the resources to help solve some of the biggest problems that we have, like climate change or the climate apocalypse, that I, that I, uh, that's the term I use to probably define it. But only if we, the people inside those corporations, rise up and take control. Corporations don't control what we do. We control what corporations do. So my thesis and what I'm betting my entire life on is there's enough of us who feel this way then we can find ways to lead these companies in ways that drive profitability, drive brand love, and do a lot of good in the world. And that's what I want to talk about today. 
Um, as Jean-Francois mentioned, um, my exit from corporate life uh, came in 2016. That's why I worked for Procter & Gamble, Nokia, Heineken, Absolute Vodka for 20 years. And my exit came in 2016 when I wrote Good is the New Cool, Market Like You Give a Damn, to give it its full title, which was really an exploration of this idea of purpose and social impact, primarily from a marketing lens. What we do now is really explore this space uh, through a holistic lens, looking at how purpose drives employee engagement, product innovation, how it drives long-term profitability. Um, our purpose when we wrote this book was to serve the world changers, the innovators and provocateurs who believe in using business and culture as forces for good. Um, by the way, I can see some of you taking pictures of the slides. Feel free to take as many pictures if you want, but if you'd like the entire presentation in PowerPoint, just hit me up on LinkedIn and I'll send it to you in a Google Drive. I'll make your note-taking a little easier as well. Um, we do this through Conspiracy of Love, which I know sounds like a Barry White album name. <laughs> Conspiracy of Love. 1977. My wife pointed this out to me. <laughs> I should tell you where the name comes from. It comes from this wonderful quote by the American Senator Cory Booker. And he said, we are all products of a positive conspiracy of love between our parents, teachers, neighbors, and friends who all conspired with love to give us support and kick our ass to help us where we got to need to get to. And therefore, we need to form a new conspiracy of love to help other people need to, uh, to help them get to where they need to get to. I also think about brands as being conspiracies of love, right? Between the people inside of them and the people outside of them. So that's where the name came from and not Barry White, just in case you're wondering. So I'll take you back in time to what we saw happening around us when we started writing the book. The first thing was this, all these brands who were doing well by doing good. We started to see them pop up in so many different categories. Tesla and cars, Warby Parker and Patagonia and Tom's and fashion, Honest Company and Method and CPG. Kind bars, Ben and Jerry's in food. This wasn't just newer startups, by the way. This is a page from Unilever's sustainable brand summary. More than half of Unilever's growth, I think today it's actually 70%, is coming from the most sustainable brands in its portfolio. So there's something going on that business is waking up to this idea of brands doing good. Today, we're now seeing brands taking stands. So this is Levi's coming out in favor of sensible gun regulation. This is Nike using Colin Kaepernick as the 30th anniversary of their Just Do It campaign. Colin Kaepernick, a well-known activist who has used his presence in the NFL to talk about pro police brutality. This is Gillette trying to start a conversation about toxic masculinity. Whether you agree with what their, their stances are or not, or whether you think they did a good job or not, this is now the new normal. People expect the brands in their lives to have a point of view and state that. But here's my thesis. We have to go beyond advertising. Advertising is just chapter one when it comes to solving a social problem. It's great if we're thinking about introducing a topic and fueling some dialogue. I'm obsessed with chapter two. How do we bring, build long-term, sustainable, profitable platforms that tackle social and environmental problems? That's really where the meat of this lies. So this is all great, but we need to get to chapter two. The second thing you notice is this, the architects of cool are activists. So by architects of cool, it meant anybody who influences pop culture. We saw this when you saw Beyonce at the Super Bowl talking about Black Lives Matter, Lady Gaga at the Oscars and the Grammys, LeBron James at the ESPYs. This again has also accelerated in recent months. We've seen Jay-Z and Meek Mill launch an organization that's looking at the huge problem of mass incarceration in the United States. We're seeing LeBron James open up a school in Akron, Ohio, and say this is one of the greatest moments of his life. We're seeing Alfonso Coron, who is the award, Academy Award-winning director of Roma, use Roma to start a conversation about giving undocumented workers <laughs> rights. Think about this. This is the biggest rapper on the planet, the biggest basketball star on the planet, and the biggest movie director on the planet. All of them using the power of cool to talk about good. So this is another trend that isn't going anywhere, anywhere soon. The third thing we noticed was this, the new nonprofits. So hands up here, anybody who works for a nonprofit or works with nonprofits. Okay. Nonprofits, I love the work that they do, right? I love Amnesty International, love Greenpeace. But I, we started to see this new generation of nonprofits who are moving at the speed of culture, moving at the speed of technology, thinking like brands. This is charity, this is Pencils of Promise, who build schools all across the world with Justin Bieber. This is Charity Water, who build wells at a frankly dizzying rate by getting people to commit their birthdays. This is a scene from the Global Citizen Festival. It's the hottest music festival in New York City. You get thousands of people in Central Park there. The only way you can get in 
is by doing acts of social kindness. So we thought, hmm, there's something really interesting going on here at this intersection of commerce, conscience, and culture. What happens when you take brands, the commerce part, with their resources and reach, and to them you add nonprofits, the conscience part, with their depth of knowledge to solve social problems, and then you add culture, you add the cool, you add great storytelling, great design, great aesthetics, to bring people into doing good. At Conspiracy of Love, we spend a lot of time thinking about what goes in the middle and trying to design platforms that do all of these three things as well. Now, why is all this happening? We believe that there's three tectonic shifts happening to companies all at the same time. Number one, there's a shift of consumers who now want to buy products and services from companies that do good. Number two, there's a shift of employees who now want to work for those companies. And number three, there are now a rising amount of investors who want to put money into those companies. So if you're a modern day CEO, you're starting to see this happen in three different locations as it pertains to your company. Let's start with the first, consumers. Social activism is now becoming one of the leading indicators of brand strength. So if you look at this data, leading edge or cool is number one, but look at number two. People really want to know the values of the brands and services that they support. In fact, this is only getting bigger. This is the Edelman Trust Barometer. 57% are buying or boycotting brands based on the brand's position on a social or political issue. You saw this with stuff like Delete Uber. This is up 30% from three years ago. So this trend is accelerating. Companies are in the spotlight now a lot more in terms of not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. The global opportunity is pretty huge. Millennials have an annual spending power of $2.5 trillion 95% of them say they would switch brands to one that supported a good cause in an authentic, meaningful manner. That's the size of the prize out there. It's summed up in this great quote from the writer Anne Lappy, every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world that you want to live in. And especially now, especially with this generation, you're starting to see this more and more. In the amazing kids from Parkland, the victims of a school shooting, this is Emma Gonzalez, and the work that they've been doing to battle the National Rifle Association. This is Boyan Slat, who was 18 years old when he decided to create a device to clean up the world's oceans and now runs the Ocean Cleanup Project. This is the frankly amazing Greta Thunberg, the young 16-year-old Swedish girl who's now on the cover of Time magazine and may be even nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for her action in drawing um, attention to the global climate crisis. These kids are out there ringing the alarm bells. I think we need to go help them. I think we can't just say, the kids are the new generation of leaders, they're inheriting a flaming dumpster fire of a planet that we are leaving them. I think we need to go help them with this as well. Let's take a look at investors. What you're now starting to see is a correlation between social responsibility and shareholder returns, an analysis of the S&P 500. The most socially responsible brands are outperforming those who are doing the least by 26%. So you can blow up that myth that it's doing good doesn't lead to profitable shareholder returns. In fact, this is now what's happening. Major, major companies, uh, investment banks, are coming into this space. This rather stern-looking gentleman, some of you may know, is Larry Fink. He is the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, the single largest institutional investor on the planet. $6.3 trillion under management. That's trillion with a TR. And it's now come out and said, from now on, all the companies we invest in, we need to see social impact alongside financial returns. This is only accelerating. If you look at what's going on in the broader investment world, we've gone from ethical funds and SRIs and ESGs to impact investing. I think today there's 114 billion. I believe it's on track to hit half a trillion dollars in the next five years. This is capital looking for companies that provide social returns alongside financial. What's even more fascinating is the rise of what I call consumer-led financial options to invest ethically. This is Swell, it's an inve it's a impact investing platform that allows you to take your pension and put it into companies that only support clean energy uh, or clean water and things like that. Imagine what happens when the trillions of dollars locked up in pensions start to flow towards ethical investment as well. All of this is coming at somewhat of a bad time for companies in the S&P 500. They're going extinct faster than ever before. The average lifespan of a company has gone from 67 years to 15 years. I know this, I was inside one of these companies when this happened, I worked for Nokia. <laughs> Hands up everybody who owned a Nokia phone. Now keep it up if you still got one. <laughs> Good for you, my friend. 
I want to come and see you later. I'm joining you offline. It's like you flip phone. <laughs> Nokia, when I joined it, that single company was responsible for 40% of the Finnish GDP. One company. Where is it now? Companies are going bankrupt, extinct faster than ever before. I think it's because of this. Consumers wouldn't care if 74% of brands disappeared. There are just too many of them, and our thesis is only the ones who really add value and really show up in people's lives usefully are going to be around. All right, more good news. Employees. You're seeing two new generations of employees entering the workforce, millennials and Gen Z. Vastly different expectations of what they want from companies. 64% of millennials won't take a job if their employer doesn't have a strong CSR practice. 85% of Gen Z employees believe that companies have an obligation. I like that word, so I'll say it again. An obligation to help solve social problems. So if you want to future-proof your organization for the next two generations of talent, you have to show them how their work ladders up to something meaningful. This is taking on even stronger uh, manifestations. This is the Google walkout. This is what we call the rise of white-collar employee activism. Remember when the only employees striking used to be miners or teachers or blue-collar workers? These are white, highly paid white-collar workers, 20,000 Google employees walking out on one day in protest against their employer paying money to alleged sexual harassers. 20,000 people on one day in multiple offices around the world. By the way, my favorite part of it was that they used Google Docs to organize the walkout. <laughs> the irony is wonderful. This is only picking up steam. This was yesterday in Boston. You may have seen this. This is Wayfair Workers. This is a company that makes beds, who were selling those beds to the detention centers where they were imprisoning young, young children. And the employee said, no, we don't want this. We're walking out. They sent a letter to their CEO. They staged a walkout. You now have a new constituency, the people inside your company who are going to hold your company to a higher standard as well. Now, all of this is also coming at somewhat of a bad time for morale. So I'm going to do a little uh, audience participation here. Gallup did a global poll, and they asked people for one question. This is 140 countries. Are you happy and engaged at work? And I want you guys to yell out, what percentage said, yes, I am happy and engaged? Shout. 30? Higher than 30? 40? 6? 60? Do I see 60? I feel like a bitter. 60. Do I see higher than 60? 13%. Only 13% of people said, yes, I'm happy and engaged at work. If you're doing the math, that's 87% of people said, no, I'm not. They were either apathetic and disengaged, or they really hated their jobs. Gallup called this a shocking waste of talent, and I agree. I think about all those people sitting there watching their clots going, get me the hell out of here. Think about all that potential that is stored up in the 87%. So the next question is, well, what do those people in the 13% have? What do the 87% want? And here, again, the data is quite clear. When asked about career goals, this, by the way, isn't just millennials and Gen Z. This is every single age cohort, so Gen X and baby boomers as well. Number one, I want to make a positive impact in my organization. Number two, I want to help solve social and or environmental challenges. They are telling us that they want purpose and meaning in the work that they do. So if you're able to frame what your company does and show them how their task, however humble, ladders up to a greater good, that's what purpose can do. That's how purpose can help reframe people's ideation of what they do for a living as well. Elon Musk sums it up when he says, putting in long hours for a uh, corporation is hard, putting in long hours for a cause is easy. You even see this in pay. People are happy to take a lower paying job at a nonprofit because why? It gives them more meaning. This is why I speak about this topic because I truly believe that if we can help people get purpose in the paycheck, to have the same benefits and the same salaries, but bring more purpose and meaning into the work that they're already doing, then we have a win-win situation as well. So here's what we did after interviewing all these people for the book. We put together this model. This is our thesis for a purpose-driven brand in, in the 21st century. Here's the model. I'll go through this really quickly. One is know your purpose. Know why you exist as a company beyond just making money. Two is then find your allies. Find those other organizations whether they be nonprofits, other companies, uh, culture creators who have the same purpose as you do. Three, think about people as citizens, not just consumers. Think about them 
in a rich, multidimensional way. Four, lead with the cool and bake in the good. Make sure you still use the power of great design and storytelling to bring people into this, this campaign or this mission. Five, don't advertise, solve problems. Think about what problems you can solve in their lives from the everyday to the epic. If you do this, you trigger number six, people are the new media. Today, more than ever before, people can take your message to the world. And seven, this is super important, always, always make sure you back up the promise with the proof. Otherwise, you will get ripped to shreds if you talk the talk without showing proof of how you're walking the walk. So, let me get through some of these into a little bit more detail. One is know your purpose. And I said this before, this kind of applies in two levels. Your organizational purpose, but your own personal purpose as well. But let's talk about organizations first. This is the best definition I've seen for purpose. An aspirational reason for being, which inspires and provides a call to action for an organization and its stakeholders and benefit to local and global society. A bit wordy, but pretty uh, in, in depth. Um, in our book, we say purpose is the first P of marketing. So remember the other four Ps, product, price, place, promotion. Well, we say purpose should be the first because if you don't know what purpose your company or product serves, how can you know what to make and what price to price it at? Um, I wanted to geek out for a second on terminology because I think this is one of the biggest problems in the space. Nobody has common terminology. Oftentimes, purpose and mission are interchanged, which is totally cool, but the way, this is how we do it at Conspiracy of Love. Your purpose is why you exist. This should last 100 years. Uh, this is the reason for being, the raison d'etre. Your vision then is much more granular. It is what kind of company that you want to build. Uh, we want to be the world's leading blah, blah, blah by 2025. It has some constraints. It gives you some focus. And the vision is what needs to be achieved in order to achieve the purpose. The mission or missions are the series of big, bold steps that you as a company need to take to achieve that vision. Here is our product mission. Here is our people mission. Here is our societal mission. You have the values, which is the attitude and tonality. How does the company show up in the world? How does it behave? All of that is wrapped up in the positioning, which is really the only bit that the outside world should see. And so this is how we look at creating a purpose-driven brand in the 21st century. Here's a few examples of brands that I think have great purposes. Nike, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Love the little asterisk. If you, are, if you have a body, you are an athlete. I like to say to Nike, I don't think you've seen my body. You may have a different idea. <laughs> um, Tesla, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Um, what's really interesting about this purpose is that about three years ago, it said sustainable transport. Just by changing that one word, Tesla has signaled a whole new market intention. They are no longer content to just have the car in your garage. They want to have the solar roof towels on your house. They want to have the power wall battery that stores all the energy. They want to be the apple of clean energy. So it just goes to show you how a well-written purpose, the intention can change just through even one word. Patagonia. I love Patagonia. They changed this purpose three years, three months ago. Patagonia is in business to save our home planet. Couldn't be more blunter and on the nose than that. And finally, Adidas, through sport, we have the power to change lives. Simple, crisp, clean, clear. So everybody with me on what purpose looks like? All right. The next uh, principle is find your allies. You don't have to do this alone. And one of the best examples that I've come across recently for finding your allies is XPRIZE. So hands up if you've heard of XPRIZE. It's a really interesting organization based in Los Angeles who have tried to crack some of the world's biggest problems through crowdsourcing challenges. So they come up with a really big problem, they then get brands to sponsor those prize funds, and then they issue these challenges to the world. Here's a little example of what they do. We are inherently explorers. We are inherently inventors. We are inherently discoverers. We are inherently problem solvers. People have to keep that flame burning. Making the world a better place is a primal human instinct. Social change is a team sport. Give someone a challenge and the tools to solve it, that's one of the thrills of being human. That's how things change. We're entering a day and age where literally almost anything can be made possible. That's what XPRIZE does. We set very audacious, 
but achievable goals. We leverage them with a million or $10 million, and then we go to the world and say, I don't care who you are, where you've gone to school, what you've done before, the first person to make that happen wins. You help bring about a breakthrough, and we all win. It's a way to capture people's imagination and get them focused on a topic, and typically, some of the best solutions come from people you wouldn't expect. In X-Prize, we are harnessing the power of imagination to see a positive future and figure out a way to accelerate that future so that it can happen right now. So that was the, the last one you saw was the Google Lunar X-Prize. So Google put up a $10 million fund for the first group of private citizens who would put a spacecraft on the moon. Think about that. How audacious is that as an idea? They came super close and they, they crashed. But think about the idea of putting the, the, the challenges of the world um, to the people of the world. This is another great example. This is the Water Abundance X Prize. I truly believe water is going to be one of the central environmental issues of our time. Um, there's only 1% of water on the planet that's drinkable, and that is rapidly getting polluted due to um, everything from you know, um, caffeine to um, antidepressants. This was a challenge to pull 2,000 liters of water a day out of thin air for less than two cents a liter using the power of clean energy. A pretty audacious uh, X Prize, and this gentleman won it, this guy David Hertz, um, for creating this device, which you can see behind him, um, and, and, cr and meeting that challenge. Think about these devices being on the roof of every single house, every single condo building. There's actually more water in the atmosphere than there is in all the lakes and rivers on the planet combined. This is a revolutionary technology, and it wouldn't have come to light unless XPRIZE had created this platform for people to find allies between the brands who funded it, between the scientists in the world, and between ordinary people like David, who managed to win it as well. So I think it's an excellent example of it. It's also a principle I want to talk about, which is what happens beyond sustainability? I know all of your companies must have some sort of sustainability manifesto in place, I don't think sustainability is enough anymore. We have now gotten to the point where we need to invest in restoration, not preservation. The state of this planet is so broken that I believe that companies need to go beyond putting back what they took and going into actively repairing some of these ecosystems. And to me, what's brilliant about that XPRIZE, the water abundance, is that's an abundant technology. Those on roofs of buildings can actually give back more than take, that you take as well. So, you're going to see this theme about how do companies give back more uh, than they take, I think, become a really big one. The next principle is lead with the cool. Uh, and my favorite story to talk about right now is what Adidas is doing. Do you say Adidas or Adidas here? Adidas. <laughs> Everybody yells at me when I say Adidas. <laughs> but that's how Run DMC said it. Um, so some of you may know the story about the ocean plastic shoes. Raise your hands if you know about this. Okay. So these shoes you see on the far left-hand corner were made out of tr ocean trash pulled from the oceans by Polly for the Ocean. I'm actually wearing a pair of the Generation 3s today, if you want to come and take a look later on. They're highly comfortable. What you may not know is that Adidas went from 7,000 pairs of those shoes in year one to 1 million pairs, to 5 million pairs, to 11 million pairs this year. The average retail price of these shoes is $225. If you do the math, that is a cool $2 billion that Adi is going to make from solving the problem of ocean trash. Think about this. This is the engine of capitalism at work solving social problems. The more shoes they sell, the more money they make, the more trash they pull out of the ocean. Suddenly you have a virtuous loop. And to me, this is one of the great studies, greatest case studies to show that purpose can be profitable, highly, highly profitable. This may be why Adidas has announced even more audacious technology. You may have seen this. This is the Adidas Future, Proof, uh, Future Craft Loop Sneaker. It is the world's first 100% recyclable sneaker. It's made out of one material, which means when you are finished using it, you send it back to Adidas, and they grind it down, and they send you a new one. If we can see things for what they are, if we can see what they could be, if the plastic we use, we never throw away, if the end of one thing could be the beginning of the next. If 
we know that less can create more. If we can return, we reciprocate, we regenerate. If we are here for others, if we can work as a team, all we have to do is connect, and the world opens up. The future is about giving back. This is a super exciting initiative. It's the world's first circular economy sneaker, and it has massive implications for all of our businesses. The Adidas CMO, who I had the pleasure of interviewing for my Forbes column, said this. He said, you know when you throw things away, there is no away. There's just this planet. And he brings up this really interesting idea. Waste is only waste if we waste it. Waste is a revenue stream. And if you're not thinking about a circular economy strategy for all of your products, I guarantee you your competition will be. This is how you solve the problem of being a consumption-driven company, by making sure you take back everything that you produce and put it back into your own material stream in a highly profitable way as well. It's summed up in this great quote by Peter Diamandis, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities for those companies that are brave enough and innovative enough to find solutions for it as well. Okay, moving on. The next principle is think citizens, not consumers. Somewhere in my career as a marketer, I started to get really pissed off with the word consumer. It seemed like such a narrow, transactional way to talk about another human being. All I want you to do is consume. I think if you think about people as citizens with a broad range of interests and passions that you as a brand and company can engage in, I think suddenly you can have a much richer conversation with them as well. A company doing an amazing job of this is actually SAP. So hands up if you use SAP in your companies. I'm sure many of you do. Um, you may not know about this particular case. I met this amazing gentleman, Justin Dillon, who uh, works as an anti-slavery campaigner. Now, I didn't know this, but there's over 40 million people in the world today who are still slaves. This is at more, uh, more than any other time in human history. These could be women caught in sex trafficking. This could be men entrapped in fishing fleets. This could be the kids digging coltan in a war zone. Coltan is the mineral that is often phone, found in mobile phones. 40 million people in the world today are still slaves. Justin set out to solve this problem by creating awareness. And the first thing he did was create this thing called slaveryfootprint.org. It is live now, any of you can go to it. It's a place where you enter your consumption habits and it tells you how many slaves work for you. Not if, how many slaves work for you. Because the dirty little secret Justin uncovered was that buried deep in every supply chain, there is always the risk of forced labor. And he tried to solve this problem by awareness. He had 30 million people go to this website, but he uncovered a bigger problem. You see, the total amount of money that goes into anti-slavery nonprofits is in the tens of millions. The total amount of money that is generated by the global slavery industry is in the tens of billions. So he was massively outgunned. Until he met this guy. This guy's Kelly Miller, and he works for SAP. And when he and Justin met, they realized they had two halves of the same problem. I'll let Kelly tell you his story in his own words. I am very grateful because every morning I get to get up and drive to work and work at a company that is making an impact not only with our customers, but making an impact on the world. SAP is the largest uh, enterprise software company in the world. I run the North American market unit for financial services for our supply chain and procurement business, which is called Ariba. Ariba is unique because we have the world's largest e-commerce network. So think of Facebook, eBay, and Amazon for business, only much bigger. We do almost a trillion dollars worth of commerce. So we have the scale and reach where we are, we're impacting commerce all over the world. In 2012, I was at a conference and they were talking about this end it thing, which turned out that they were bringing awareness to this issue of slavery in the world. This guy started talking about how he wanted to end forced labor in the supply chain. And so I'm thinking, if I could somehow take what he's doing, productize it and get it onto our network, potentially two million companies could be exposed to these type of ideas. So I got in touch with Justin and our first conversation was over two hours long. And the reason that it was such a long conversation is because it was from the very beginning, it was obvious that this was a perfect marriage of 
what, what he had and what my company had. So Justin had done the research, compiled the data, and had everything that was necessary information-wise for companies to actually figure this out. But he had no mechanism, no platform to deliver it. We decided to engage, we decided to take action, and we started this process of, of a three-year journey where we engaged some of the world's largest global brands that are our customers. And we got input on what do you need? What do you need to be empowered and equipped to help end slavery in the world? So this is the result of what they came up with. It's called a freedom tool. It's part of SAB Ariba's suite of services. This is very simply a mechanism that allows chief procurement officers in any company to look deep into their supply chain and find instances of forced labor. Suddenly you have the trillions of dollars in the global supply chain now battling the billions of dollars in the anti-slavery industry. To me, this is a beautiful example of how purpose can work even if you're a B2B company. Hands up who, is who, who represents a B2B company here as well. This is a question I get asked. This is great for consumers. What about B2B? To me, this shows how a B2B company can create something that is magnificently useful, that does a lot of good in the world today, and is highly profitable for them. We had the chairman of SAP on stage at Davos last year talking about how this made people feel proud to come to work for his company as well. Um, Justin has this beautiful way of words, and he said, most people in the world have a poverty, uh, in, the, in, the, in the developing world have a poverty of means, but people in the developed world have a poverty of meaning. Corporations are one of those places that can solve both of those problems at the same time. A platform like uh, SAP and the Freedom Tool does both of those things as well. So I thought that was a beautiful way to think about um, how corporations can solve both of those problems. The next principle is don't advertise, solve problems. We believe brands should solve problems from the everyday to the epic. And a company that's actually been doing a great job of reverse engineering purpose into who they are is Microsoft. Microsoft is cool. I never thought I would stand on the stage and say that, but Microsoft is cool. So a few years ago when Satya Nadella joined the organization, um, he challenged them to come up with this purpose, which is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. What's really fascinating is seeing how Microsoft is focused on the issue of disability as the place that they can really make a difference. You may have seen the Microsoft Super Bowl ad around the adaptive Xbox. So this is an Xbox controller for kids with disabilities that allow them uh, to play it anywhere. Microsoft is doing some amazing work in the fields of Microsoft Office, helping read letters aloud to people and things like that. But this is my favorite story. This is, in, this is a guy uh, called Saqib Sheikh. So you'll see him on the left there standing with uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. Saqib Sheikh is a blind Microsoft engineer. And he was sick of sitting in meetings where he didn't know what was going on. So he created this. I'm Saqib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where it was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well or are they half asleep and you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised, 20 year old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. 
And then he'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. It's a remarkable story, right? This is the, uh, yeah. This is the Seeing AI app. You can download it as an app on Android or iOS, and you just use your phone, you hold it up, you don't need the funky glasses, and uh, it shows you what's around you. And what I love about this story is that, to me, it's what happens when purpose comes full circle. By creating a purpose-driven culture and, uh, and empowering your employees to come up with innovations on their own, something remarkable happens. What Sakib Sheikh did was to think about disability as an engine of innovation. And solving for one, for himself, he solved for so many million people out there. And not just visually disabled people, think about the use cases of what he created. You're in a foreign country, you can't read the sign, you hold this app up. You're somebody who's losing sight and is short-sighted like my mom, and she can use it in a dark place to read a menu. Think about the implications of Microsoft now integrating that technology into what it's creating and putting it out in the world. And think about how that can lead to a whole new wave uh, a whole new uh, OS, a whole new AI approach that wouldn't have happened if this person wasn't there in that organization and felt empowered to do this. We talk a lot about conspiracy of love, about creating the intersection of useful and delightful, and Saqib Sheikh created exactly that. So I love that. I love that story. Okay, final principle, back up the promise with the proof. We put this in one in here because we started to see major companies like Pepsi absolutely screw up with things like the Kendall Jenner ad. Do you remember that one where Kendall Jenner suddenly turned into a civil rights activist? Um, people are highly skeptical of companies. And if you wander into this space without trying to make sure your own house is in order or try and make claims that aren't true, people are going to rip you to shreds. We like to say purpose needs to be built inside out of a company. Companies are not transparent. They can look inside of you and find out what really you're, whether you're walking the walk as well. A few places where this needs to happen, something as simple as volunteering and fundraising. It may seem really cheesy and unnecessary, but companies that offer those opportunities have 57% less turnover. The average cost to replace an employee is 1.2 times the annual salary. So just by providing simple opportunities for people to bring meaning into their work by engaging with the community, you can do a lot of good. The next is gender equality. It is 2019. There is absolutely no reason men should not be, or women should not be getting paid exactly the same as men. There's spreadsheets for that kind of thing. I'll do you one further. There's absolutely no reason why women should not have exactly the same amount of board positions as men, too. Here's some data to back it up. Companies with the highest percentage of women board directors outperform those with the least by 53%. So that's a pretty good statistic to take into it as well. When it comes to diversity and representation, oftentimes there's this kind of like token buzzword around it. This is the Harvard Business Review's take on it. Companies with above average diversity have 19% higher innovation revenues. To me, it's all summed up in this picture you see over my head. This is the Nike Pro Hijab for Muslim women. Why did it take a company the size of Nike all this time to figure out that there's 500 Muslim women on the planet and some of them like to jog? You need to have a culture inside your company that reflects the world that you are trying to reach. At Conspiracy, we say diversity is the only global growth strategy. You need to have that representation at senior levels so that you can see around corners, see white spaces, understand cultural nuances as well. All right, final thoughts. We're really in a moment that I want you guys to think transformationally, not just transactionally. Elon Musk is building us rockets to go to Mars, for God's sake. We can think big. When you're thinking about purpose, think about it as the next competitive advantage, just like digital was. It's something that if you embrace early and master, it can be something as transformative and as disruptive as digital was as well. My friend Max Lenderman has a wonderful quote, purpose is the new digital. 
for companies. A few things to keep in mind. Purpose is a journey, not a destination. This is an ongoing thing, so don't worry if you're not perfect. You all have to start somewhere. As long as you're honest and humble about it and saying, look, we're not perfect, but we're trying to solve this problem. Will you help us? People will come along for the ride with you. That's also the idea behind this principle. Be the helper, not the hero. A mistake a lot of companies do when getting into this space is to shine a spotlight on themselves and say, look at us, how awesome we are. Look at this amazing work we're doing. And that just comes across as egocentric and arrogant and self-indulgent. Instead, if you say, hey, we're trying to solve this problem. Will you come and help us solve it with us? And being humble, that's a much better approach to take in this space. Uh, my friend Sarah Vaughan, who used to be the head of sustainability at uh, Unilever, has this great idea also of picking your swords and shields. There are going to be some issues, like sustainability, for example, which might be a shield. It's just the cost of doing business. It's a hygiene factor. The swords are the really interesting ones. That's the purpose-driven crusades, where they say, we are going to fix this problem on the planet and do it profitably and do it sustainably as well. It may surprise you to know that corporations have more resources than government. This is Professor Michael Porter. Nonprofits, 1.2 trillion. Government, 3.1 trillion. Corporations, 20.1 trillion. The power is in those corporations, and by extension, the power is in here in this room today. You can all do a tremendous amount of good right from where you're sitting. You don't have to quit your job and go and dig wells with a nonprofit in the Sahara. In fact, I would encourage you to keep your day jobs. You're more valuable right here where you are with your experience and your, your network and your resources as well. We like to say that we are moving beyond the era of corporate social responsibility into the era of corporate social opportunity. Problems are gold mines for those companies who are brave enough and innovative enough to go out there and find a way to fix them. But here's some very important advice. Your values have to drive your value. You have to use your hearts, not just your head. That's how you make sure it's authentic. You have to use this muscle. And this is the one that we get trained to use in companies. Um, as somebody wise said, the longest journey you'll ever take is from your head to your heart. Make sure you think about stuff at this level as well when you're thinking about doing this work. I'm going to end with a quote with a woman I love, Brené Brown, who said, you can choose courage or you can choose comfort, but you can't choose both. Right now, when the world is the state the way it is, I ask you to choose courage. Choose courage when you go back to these companies that you lead and help the people in them find their own purpose and meaning. Choose courage when you go back to these communities as citizens and find new ways to help them thrive and prosper. Choose courage as you think about your own purpose in life and how you can leave this planet in slightly better shape than you found it. This moment we are in is a gift. How will you start today? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We've got a few minutes for questions. Oh, the slideo question thing. All right. It's the first time I've done this. What do you think about the perpetuating nature of big business simply needing to make money for shareholders at any cost? How do these organizations change? Great question. Uh, thank you, Anonymous. <laughs> Why couldn't you just put your name on it? Um, I think the data is showing that those businesses that are only focused on making money for shareholders are going out of business. And I think you have to now think about the stakeholder, the wider, wider environment that you operate in. I think a better question to ask is, how can we show those companies that the ROI of doing good is going to make them more money for their shareholders and for all the other stakeholders as well? That's really where we need to come up with new models and new business cases to show that, just like the Adidas example as well. Ultimately, for purpose to become sustainable, it needs to be profitable. This is the business world we're talking about as well. So to me, really, it's about understanding those, those ROI models and how they change as well. Thank you, Anonymous. Do you feel, oh, how big is the problem of greenwashing? How do we avoid it? Great question. Uh, there's an even better, uh, better uh, phrase, which is woke washing which is companies pretending to be woke or socially enlightened as well. How do we avoid it? Um, I think that you know, we talked about purpose being driven inside out. 
I think it starts with you guys inside the companies holding yourselves to that high standard and making sure you're not making claims that are wildly untrue. But I think e the even bigger question you've got to ask yourselves is, how do you stop consumers calling bullshit in what you do? Because that is the area you're living in right now. You don't control the narrative anymore. People can leave peer-to-peer -peer reviews in Amazon. They can use social media to call you out. Hell, they can use Glassdoor to find out what it's really like to work in your company. You are living in an era of radical transparency right now. So the only way to avoid claims of greenwashing is to just not do it. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, how, how, can, how can today's leaders influence the purpose when they don't relate to it? That's a good question. So you meaning um, they don't have a personal affinity to the purpose of the company? That's a great question. Um, I think with great purpose-led companies, if you think about Patagonia, for example, these companies have had their purpose so clear for decades that people gravitate towards working for them. Um, and so you know what you're getting into when you come and work for them as well. So one thing we always try and say is try and keep it as consistent as possible. Don't keep changing it because that's very hard. It makes it very hard for people to know what you stand for. I think the simpler question, the answer to this question is if you don't, if you don't, um, the purpose of the organization you work for doesn't resonate with you, go and find one that does. Simple as that. Uh, do companies fail to solve some of the world's problems because they're worried about adjusting their tried and tested business models? Yes, I think they are, you know, but I think it was Sir J. Brin from Google who said the biggest risk is taking no risk at all. Companies have to innovate faster and bigger than ever before just to keep pace in what's happening out there as well. Um, and so I get asked this question all the time. How do you try and convince companies to adopt purpose when they're not ready to? And I go, I don't. I go and talk to their competition who's ready to do it. <laughs> it's a much simpler approach. Um, how can we get lens technology and SAP together? How do we get B2Bs to act without the threat of social activism and social media? I'm not sure what lens technology and SAP together. You mean the Microsoft thing and SAP? Oh, you've been using that? There you go. Uh, I, I did not know that, but there you go. I think that's, that's a supply chain question um, that we need to get them together. How do we get B2Bs to act without the threat of social activism and social media? I'll, I'll answer that question slightly differently because here's another common misconception about purpose is that it has to be political, right? A lot of companies are like, oh my God, do I have to get out there and risk pissing off half of my consumers by saying something that the other half is going to really object to? There's a difference between doing good and being an activist. Some companies can be an activist and choose to. Patagonia can choose to do that. That is a high wire rope. It takes up a lot of time and attention. And I know from talking to some of these CMOs and CEOs, it takes up all their time. There's a difference between being an activist and doing good. There is a vast chunk of things that everybody believes, regardless of what political stripe they are. Everybody wants um, great schools for their kids, safe neighborhoods, clean air opportunities. Look at all of those things that the vast majority of everybody wants and turn your company's attention towards focusing on, on solving those problems and you won't have a problem with politics as well. <laughs> How do you sustain your own level of energy? <laughs> Caffeine and jet lag. <laughs> um, I think that was it. Any other questions from the audience with microphones and things like that? There is one. Don't yeah. Business is ready to adopt circular economy principles on a wider scale. Oh, and we were discussing this at lunch. Yeah, I think I, I go back to this thing: if you if waste isn't waste until you waste it, right? And I think as we begin to think about all these companies um, who aren't utilizing the revenue stream that could be created either through reusing the raw materials that go into producing the, their products and services, or by finding a way to bring it back. And you're reusing it. So I think Apple has announced by a certain date they won't be making iPhones out of anything except old iPhones. So there will be no new minerals that they pull out into the ground. I'd like to see that in principles like Adidas adopted by all companies because I suspect in the long run it will be cheaper once you actually set up that circular economy supply chain. Um, so I think that the trick is to make the economic argument for it first before making the political argument for it. 
I always say that today, um, to be a purpose-driven leader, you need the brain of a CFO, the heart of a storyteller, and the soul of an activist. I think if you can put those three things um, together, then I think you can really make long-term sustainable change. And as I'm listening to you, I'm also thinking about one of the things that uh, Peter Gozer told us. Uh, on occasion, leaders are also paid to take a hit. Yeah. On occasion. Yeah. Please give him a warm head of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are about at the close of the program. What did we do this week? I guess there was on one side a lot of IMD faculty members. There were six keynote speakers. There were many, many guest speakers. And there were 400 of you coming from, from all over the world. There was also a week that you took off uh, and, and hopefully mostly off. I'm sure that during the day and in the evening, there were some emails and some phone calls, but hopefully you also had a chance to take a step back. And that's not on this page, but it's the one thing that enables all of this. So I hope that at the end of that week, uh, you feel a bit refreshed, a bit re-energized, uh, stimulated, hopefully engaged. Um, and, and you also need to remember that you cannot be engaging if you're not engaged. And so hopefully you will leave uh, IMD with a little bit more energy. Um, these 400 people were on a picture. You need to make sure that you get your picture and your certificate before leaving. And we also have, I think, a two-minute video uh, to give you a, a, a very quick snapshot of that week. What is orchestrating winning performance? Inspirational. Diverse. Enriching. Getting the latest knowledge, but in a very pragmatic way. OWP has been designed to be inspiring and thought-provoking. All year long, our world-class faculty engages with the global business leaders and distills their knowledge into a fully customizable, jam-packed program that is truly second to none. Wonderful. I know the importance of education. I went out even though I was running a business to come to IMD to study. From IMD alumni who are building a better future to business leaders at the cutting edge of digital transformation and leading some of the world's best organizations. From radical thinkers on how we can lead better lives to academic trailblazers in societal structures, OWP explores the issues that confront us as individuals organizations and participants in the global economy. I think the fantastic thing of having a, a deep, intense week at IMD is that you're fully focused, fully immersed. It gets you out of the routine. It gets you, it's a break space, right? OWP is not a conventional academic executive program. By sharing research-driven insights and engaging participants through practical workshops and activities, it takes us out of the comfort zone of the classroom and, and it challenges us to re-examine our perspectives. But I think most importantly is to take back with me tools I've learned on the program that helps me become a better manager. It made me even more a strong believer that at the end you can have as many assets as you want, but you have one big asset in your company and that's your people. This has been another energizing and thought-provoking OWP week. You've played a big role in making it a success through your engagement, your insights, your openness and your curiosity. So a big thank you from us to you. We wish you continued success and we hope our path will cross again. Let me take advantage of this video to, uh, to say big, big thanks to the communications team. They've worked very hard all week to prepare short videos from one day to the next. And, uh, and, and now I think it's a very good time to give them big thanks. Can some of the comms people stand up and uh, where are they? I guess some of them are in the back. Thank you very much. So welcome to the alumni community. Uh, again, there's a site. You can have a look at it. And, and, and of course, we'll be happy to, to uh, register you on, on newsletters where, where you receive 
ideas and articles that we publish. Um, once in a while, you might even get an advertising about a new program because I don't stop all of these, and on occasion, one of them does escape. But, uh, but really, we want to mostly send uh, uh, articles and ideas. Uh, before we conclude and I give you a final thought on how you can increase your return on investment, special thanks to these five people. Uh, I, I think OWP, of course, is about you and it's about, again, the faculty, the sessions, the guest speakers, but it would not work if the logistics were not relatively seamless. This week was particularly challenging because of the heat, uh, and, and, and somehow, at least from where I sit, it seems that things generally worked quite smoothly. For things to work quite smoothly, it means you have a few people who are working very, very hard behind the scenes. So can we have those five individuals please come on stage so that we can... Uh, why are some of them getting bigger bags? Ah, I see, I see, I see, because there were some for who worked longer on the program, and then there were folks who joined them, I see. So, so Kushal and Chintze. Well done. Yeah. They worked indeed very hard, and, and also, they also picked up the, the baton kind of midstream, and that makes it even harder. So thank you very, very much. And then... Uh, Claudia, Pauline, and Marianne. Thank you. Ah, Pauline, sorry. I see. This is very sophisticated, Marianne. Wow. wow. And this lady is Cathy Schwartz. She tells me what to do when Tanya is not around to tell me what to do. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Okay, final thought. How will you increase your rupee? Uh, where rupee is your return on OWP investment. Um, our tagline is real learning, real impact. So I just want to go back to this. Uh, real learning means that you will remember some of the thoughts that you have here, some of the ideas that, were ex uh, that you were exposed to, and some of the insights that you had. If you want to remember stuff, you need to remember first that neurons that fire together, wire together. What this means is that some of the thoughts that you had this week will now be competing in your brain with thoughts that you've had thousands of times. So if, if you review your notes several times, and when I say your notes, you see notes with stars, we will also, I think we have already sent you an email where you have access to some of the presentations and the slides. And, and, and so, so review your notes plus plus. If you review these notes, you have a shot at remembering them. If you don't review them, by Monday, there will be a good memory. By Wednesday, they will start fading. And by two weeks from now, you'll look back, you go like, well, that was fun, but I don't remember much of anything. So, so, so you need to review these notes regularly. The second thing is, if you want to have impact, well, impact comes from actions. Impact doesn't just come from ideas. So if you want to take actions, you need to regularly review the actions that you're taking, the impact they have. And, and ask yourself, do I need to adjust actions accordingly? To do any of this, you're going to need to book time in your agenda to do it. If you don't book time slots for you to review your notes and review your actions, it will just not happen. I mean, you're all experienced and active enough to have noticed this, right? If you, if you start the week saying, I hope that during the week I will have a half hour, to review my notes from OWP, you, you know very well that this ain't going to happen, right? Because the whole world wants to make sure that they're going to get on your agenda. So please book some time in your agenda, once a week or once every two weeks. Again, you understand this is not for me I'm saying this for. This is for you. If you don't book a time slot that says review or reflection or reminder, then you will not have the time to review and reflect. And if you don't have the time to review and reflect, neurons will not fire together. If they don't fire together, they're not going to wire together. Voilà. So our strong, strong encouragement to you as, as you prepare to go back is to try to go to your Outlook or to whatever agenda you use and to put a few time slots over the next three months. Again, once every two weeks, an hour every two weeks. This is an investment on you to help neurons fire together so that they wire together.
We wish you safe travels. We wish you, as I said in the video, continued success at an individual level, at a corporate level, and also hopefully at, again, as, as Abdel said today, doing a few things around us that one action at a time, but also collectively contribute to make the world a slightly better place. Good luck to all of you and best wishes of success.